Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Discussions with David. I'm live streaming from here in my living room in Portland, Oregon, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. GMT. On Mondays, the broadcast is an open mic that I host, and everyone anywhere with an internet connection and a song or a poem or something they can do in front of a microphone is welcome to participate. People can sign up for the next Pandemic Open Mic Monday by going to davidrovics.com slash P-O-M-M for Pandemic Open Mic Mondays. On Tuesdays, I interview folks under the auspices of producer Peter Werby for Fifth Estate Live, a project of Fifth Estate Magazine. Wednesdays through Fridays, I host my own self-produced interview show, which has so far mainly involved catching up with old friends in a public setting, usually people I would be hanging out with in person at some point during a given year, especially around this time of year, if I were touring and playing music like in the pre-pandemic times. All of these broadcasts go out on the Facebook pages of Popular Resistance, Cable Community Radio, and various other platforms, including my Facebook page and my channels on YouTube, Periscope, Twitch, VK, and LinkedIn. Today's guest fits very squarely in that category of folks I would otherwise be hanging out with if I were on the road. I first met John Bain, better known by his stage name Attila the Stockbroker, in the mail circa 2002 when the late Pete Crook took the initiative to send John a CD of mine and send me a CD of his. Next thing I knew, I was regularly touring throughout England, Scotland, and Wales with John once or twice a year, and we also did several tours of the U.S. together, as well as Denmark one time. John Bain was born and raised on the south coast of England. His father not only survived the pandemic of 1918 as a young man, but also survived the First World War because he got the flu and went on several decades later to fall in love and father a son named John who soon became an obstreperous left-wing punk rocker with a passion for music, poetry, football, and many other things, such as history and foreign languages, which he got degrees in. His stint working in the Belgian stock exchange was very brief, and he's been a professional DIY punk rocker and ranting poet more or less ever since. In a career now spanning almost 40 years, John has put out dozens of books of brilliant poems and albums of music, and done thousands of gigs in dozens of countries, both before and after the fall of the Berlin Wall and other notable events. John, welcome to my live stream show. Great Hi. to have I'm you nice here. To you. Nice to see you again, David. It's good. Yeah, it's good. Absolutely. It is actually, you take about almost 40 years. September the 8th of this year is my 40th anniversary of my first gig as a tiller the stockbroker. And indeed, I was right. Yeah, almost and 40. Indeed, yeah, and indeed, that, that you know, it, it is, it was on the cards for me to be doing probably my biggest gig ever at Dingwalls, which is a very well known uh, London music venue, on the 10th of September with loads of my friends who I've grown up and performed with for the last 40 years. Sadly, of course, it now looks as though that's probably almost definitely not going to happen. I mean, even if the, even if it is deemed to be, um, you know, so for a start, I don't believe a single thing this government says. Uh, maybe right. you've just maybe you've just heard in the last few minutes that the chief medical officer of England has said that if or Britain has said that if the lockdown in here had happened a week earlier, but well, the number of deaths would have been halved. And of course, we are at the moment second in the league table of ignominy behind your bunch for sheer. Well, it isn't just incompetence in my view. There is an element of of, of definite social engineering in this. I mean, Cummings, the man behind the um, the Johnson administration is a, a truly horrendous individual. And I could, I would literally put nothing past him. I mean, we're That's moving the into, one who took the trip uh, up yeah, to the yeah. north of England to yeah, the yeah, lovely uh, Durham. Uh, yeah. yeah he, he, I mean, people, are, I mean, you know, I started off thinking what absolute arrogance, um, you know, he, he thinks he can do something. He can tell people to do one thing and then do the opposite. I'm coming to the conclusion now that maybe it was a deliberate, um, engineered thing in cahoots with the government in order to get people to break the lockdown so that they could get the little wage slaves back to work a bit earlier and uh, get the economy up and running again and make more money of course for the for the, the only people they care about which are their rich, rich business friends I mean, because I, you know, it I'm, is a fascinating contradiction between no, the, the whole 
proof of that, but you know. Right, right, but I but mean, there is this, this, there is. We do have lots of proof of this contradiction between these elements of the ruling class, who some of which are trying to look after the health of the public and worrying about the future, and others are just like, let's all get open up the economy again right away and get. I know. Yeah. I mean, you've got. Uh, I mean, you've got the worst example of that. I mean, I, you know, there's. I mean, it's isn't it interesting, in a horrible way, that the three governments, which are, I mean which are the most kind of right-wing, people say populist. Um, populist I'd go into yeah, that. Yeah. I, I would say opinion farming. I would say I would say opinion farming um, are, are the three with the worst record in this ghastly pandemic. Obviously. Isn't that quite something? Yeah. You know, you and, know. and then, of course, the countries that have basically some form of a proto-fascist dictatorship like, like India, uh, of course, India, Brazil, or other uh, two other countries that are doing yeah, yeah. really badly, yeah. right? And, well, yeah. I was I was I was holding Brazilian with 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 the US and the UK actually, as yeah, part of the trio of of of, of the worst ones. Um, yeah, I mean, the more basically, the more socially responsible, the more socially concerned um, the, the the country, the government, the less um, the you know the pandemic's taken hold in Cuba. Which, yeah, Cuba. Which, which liberal left? Which liberals and, and, and liberals not to f forget the far right? Which even lefty liberals will go? Oh, that's horrible! They don't have freedom of speech. No freedom of speech in Cuba. They have the freedom to stay alive, to have jobs, to have homes, and to have real amazing health care. Which means that people actually go from one one house to the next daily, checking that you haven't got the bloody thing, and making sure that you isolate if you do. I mean, great. To be frank, the greater the level of of social awareness, social commitment, and what 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 libertarians and the far right and some anarchists would say social control, um, the, the better chance you've got of surviving coronavirus. That's basically what it amounts right. to. Right, and Vietnam has also and also a shining example of a country that's dealt with it really well. And of course, the, the social democracies of Northern Europe that have done quite well. Uh, well, other than the weird Swedish situation, the Swede one, the Swedish Swedish one is very weird because they. In, they took took the wrong approach, and I thought it could be absolutely catastrophic, but it hasn't been as bad as as I th as I thought it was going to be. So there's something else strange going on there. I mean, you know, I mean, there's other stuff that we don't know about, um, which is to do with biology. Uh, which is, it's, it's obviously true at the moment that that uh, black Asian minority ethnic people are more susceptible to this. Um, there's now some kind of um, some kind of research coming out that may be the Germanic stuff, sort of or, you know, genetics is that is the least susceptible to it. I mean, the Germans seem to have escaped incredibly lightly. So, you know, maybe Sweden, um, you know, and, and, and the Nordic countries are in the same. I mean, I have no idea, but there, there's 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 all kinds of variants going on with this. And there's so know, many different factors. And like one of the things that... In which go out way beyond politics. I mean, there's some mm -hmm. things which just to do seem to do with biology and nothing else. Really. Well, going back to the pandemic of 1918, um, w one of the reasons, of course, you know, all of us have become amateur epidemiologists, right? And um, you know, it, but going back to the pandemic of 1918, Denmark uh, did very well. Uh, but they say, and, and there was suspicion at the time, was it, the, was it the healthy lifestyles of the Danes, the relatively good physical condition of the Danes, was it genetics? But ultimately they discovered that they did well because they were exposed to the first wave of the virus. And, and once they had in, immunity to the virus, the second wave didn't, the second wave was the deadly wave of the 1918 pandemic. And it was bred on the front lines of World War One. That's, that's yeah. the wave that, that almost killed your father but uh Absolutely. didn't yeah but uh that yeah those who don't know i just explain uh, my, my father was 59 when i was born which is a an amazing enough sort of thing in itself although i mean you know there are i mean i know someone who was even older when when, when, when they had a child but it is quite unusual but my dad fought in the first world war he was in the civil service rifles in in france in 1918 during the last german advance and obviously at the time that the pandemic was beginning to, to really get going. And his trench was open. The, basically, the Germans were advancing in the last advance before they basically had the armistice. And um, his trench was overrun and his entire battalion were wiped out. But by this time, he had caught the flu, in the Spanish flu. And he was in he was in the uh, in the field hospital being treated. And obviously he recovered. And so I'm I'm here. I mean, it's, and it, you know, I did, I did, I wrote a poem actually reflecting on the, on the symmetry involved of having a lung condition, um, 
at the age of 62 and having so and having effectively been given life by one pandemic and, and thinking, well, maybe the second one's going to take it away. Fingers crossed not. So far, I've done OK. I'm being very careful, though. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, very, it's a very bizarre thing because I can still cycle 40 miles without even thinking about it. But I'm on this inhaler now, which is brilliant, two, two at night and two in the morning, pink inhaler thing, which really keeps me OK. But yeah, I mean, I've got a, I've got a lung problem. I mean, I, I mean, you, you know, you probably got the same thing to some degree. I mean, you, but you smoke anyway, where you used to smoke certain certain substances, if not tobacco. Um, but it's also true that you, um, I mean, I think about this a lot in terms of the, you know, you're talking about the the, the situation with the pandemic and working and 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 all these gigs that have been canceled, which of course has been uh, true for you and for so many okay. others. But then another aspect uh, that's. Uh, you know about the working life of a working musician especially you're you're only uh, i guess what ten, a little more than 10 years older than me right but that's a very significant 10 years in terms of the amount of tobacco as a non-smoking musician the amount of tobacco you inhaled performing and it's really a very serious uh, problem for for pub workers and other Absolutely. you know club workers and musicians and you we know now it's much less of a problem yeah i mean i started I started going to gigs and performing in about 1975, remember. So that's, you know, so that's 85, 95, 05, uh, 32 years before the end of the smoking ban in the UK. And from 1980, I was doing 100 gigs or so a year as a till of the stockbroker. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it and, and I remember, I mean, the worst of them was uh, it was in, in Eastern Europe as well. I mean, in the 1980s in East Germany, I mean, I toured, I toured the GDR four times before the war came down. And it, it was like it was obligatory to smoke in the GDR. It was like you had to. It was like if you didn't, you were you were suspect. Did absolutely. they also like close all the windows before they lit up? I mean, that was the thing in Denmark. You close all the windows so you so you don't you don't make too much noise for the neighbors, yeah, and yeah. then everybody lights up. Yeah, I know. But in, in the GDR, it was even more bizarre and horrible because a lot of the gigs were taking place in old bunkers which had no windows <laughs> to begin with. So you were playing in a bunker, in a reinforced concrete bunker, sometimes underground, with no windows, in front of 100 or 200 people, every single one of whom was smoking. And it was like, for oh, fuck's sake, you know. I mean, it was, yeah. So that, and that was like the, the start of it. Anyway, you know, I'm okay. If I, I mean, I've had my lungs tested regularly recently, and they, they're certainly not getting any worse. And I'm, in every other way, I'm really fit. I mean, you know, I... I do a lot of cycling. I don't smoke. I never have smoked. That's the irony of it. But I've, I, the other interesting thing for me about lockdown is it's, it's, it's confirmed what I've always thought, which is that I'm not, but I'm a social drinker. So I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm having a pint now because I'm doing this with you, but I feel no motivation whatsoever really to drink beer, except when I'm having an interaction like this or doing an online gig. That's it's very interesting because overall the the um I believe in in Oregon I know, I don't know the number in terms of alcohol but in Oregon the statistic is in and last month uh cannabis sales in Oregon were up by 60 60 60% right, okay, So yeah. clearly people are smoking a lot more weed uh under lockdown but and, and I'm pretty sure I've heard the same about um alcohol sales although alcohol sales obviously at pubs are are, are down to nothing yeah, but they've they've, they've gone up. way way higher in in, uh, in in liquor stores and yeah yeah i mean what we what we uh, we have a lot of self help stuff going on here i mean our local pub that you know about obviously the duke of wellington uh, we are supporting those of us who can afford it are supporting the duke of wellington by buying our beer from the duke of wellington i mean they do really good beer um, that's helping them keep going they do a delivery service they deliver the beer we can pick it up from the pub at the door and it's much better coming out of the uh, out of the keg than yeah, than uh, yeah yeah. yeah. So, I mean, much better than I mean. Okay, canned beer has got better, but I want to support my local pub anyway. We're doing you know, um, there's a, there's a I mean, one of the really good things about this is the level of community cohesion and concern and general community activism has gone up phenomenally. I mean, what you know, one of the things I mean, you know, for, the first thing I had to do, and you, and you knowing me well and knowing my my relationship with technology um you will know that about 10 well it's three three months ago now i had to learn the internet i mean i'd never right. thought, i never thought that i would be sitting in front of a screen performing right i remember the first one i mean first of all i had to work out you know i can actually broadcast from the, not just from my phone i could broadcast on my actual computer 
So I've got this big widescreen computer. Obviously, this is my office. And that little green dot at the top, that's, 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 you know, that's the camera. So I can actually broadcast. If I can work, if I can find someone to tell me how to do this, I can, bro so I, so I, I worked it out. Facebook Live, <coughs> which is, I mean, for, for me, to be absolutely honest, Facebook Live is absolutely everything for me. And when got, do you do you have a regular schedule broadcasting on Facebook? Well, I, Live? I, 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 no, because I, I mean, I, I, no, I don't because I, I, what I, I do, I do, I do, you know, quite a lot of this kind of thing. Just so popping just, in, but not at yeah. a schedule. I, I try, I try and use, I try and, I try and use other people's um, uh, channels, you know, as much as as much as I can, just so that it's not so to keep it different. But I've got thirty two. Right, right. I've got thirty two thousand yeah. people on there, and I do a. I, d I tend, tend to do a broadcast a week, um, and we've raised and and, and I, d I do them to raise funds for for the local food bank and community support group. We've raised over th over three thousand pounds for that. Uh, we then we, last Saturday, it's, you won't know this, um, most of you who who are watching, whoever is. Um, but for 25 years, I've run a festival called Glastonwick, which David mm. has performed many times. And Glastonwick uh, happened oh, online this time. Glaston and, uh, you didn't know about this. It happened online. Well, I want to know, but but this, but just so just for momentary, and just for those who don't know, I mean, which is a lot of people out there. I mean, you you learning how to use the internet and also holding a festival online. I mean, just to put it into context, like you're still putting out CDs and records and not putting your albums on streaming platforms. So if people don't actually buy your and your, your latest record is fantastic. And I, I want to ask you about that, uh, about what is so significant about 1649 in the English Civil War. But uh, but if people don't aren't, go to a store or, or a concert and buy a, an actual physical CD, uh, they're going to have a, a real hard time hearing most of your wonderful recorded works as well as uh they'll have a real hard time trying to read your book because I, I believe they have to buy a physical copy of the book so no, which no, is all amazing your business model fair, i think it's not but, quite true i mean only the only the latest album i did that deliberately with the new album restoration tragedy with my band bar 1649 i did it as an experiment i made because the, the, it was it was the fundamental reason was, was two was basically two things firstly i wanted everybody who bought a copy to have in their hand the booklet or the folding um, ducks. It's a double album, the folding double album with all the lyrics and the historical explanations and photos and um, and drawings on because it's a, a, an album about the English Civil War and the radical movements which evolved therefrom between 1649 and 1660. Um, and the other, and so I wanted, first of all, I wanted everybody to have that information rather than just downloading a load of music where, where you don't get that where you can you get it but it's often it's very much a sort of secondary thing for me the the lyrics are such an essential part of what i do that the idea of just that of having something downloaded out of context to me has always been pretty dodgy but I've, it's, yes the stuff's there but one of the things i mean everybody out there is complaining you don't sell cds anymore but, but you do you when you don't put it online that's, a, you know, that's what you've discovered you know, is if you, you just keep on putting them out if you don't, if I mean, my stuff is online, but you have to look. I don't advertise it very much. You, Not you all of it, though. Like, at least if you go to Spotify, you'll only find, what, two or three of your albums? And yeah, how yeah, many yeah. have you put There's out? A few on there. I've never really promoted online sales. I've always promoted physical CD and book sales. And, and yet you have 32,000 Facebook followers. Yeah. So yeah. so it's working. I mean, whatever you're doing, it's working really it well. Works, and it's it like works. a totally different model from anything I've it, ever it tried or talked about with anybody. Well, I mean, but yeah, the, 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 the way it works, I mean, if you want to go into this, in, in because you see, this is why I, I mean, I'm, I'm not terribly keen on the ethics of Facebook. I, I tend to view it rather as, as a very useful tool, which used the right way can be a phenomenally good thing for you to use for, if you're doing the sort of thing that I'm doing but use the wrong way is absolutely disgusting I mean that's self-evident about so many things in this world now but for me it's quite simple how, how it works is I mean I am also as you know a prolific writer I write a lot of articles I write a lot about social events and politics and culture so I do my, my what you would call a blog on my Facebook performer page get incredible amounts of people reading it anything up to 20 or 30 thousand at a time without any problem at all and then inviting them to join it, so, and then many of them do, and it's a sort of constantly evolving phenomenon whereby I just reach more and more people. And then when I do a live broadcast on that platform, I'm reaching, you know, I, I, it's difficult to say, but certainly a couple of thousand people with every broadcast that I do. I mean, the ironic thing is that in the last two, 
three months or two, six, ten weeks, whatever it is, I've been reaching, you know, more people online than I've ever done at my gigs. And I mean, the yeah. reason for that as well is because I've, you know, I've been doing this for 40 years. I've done six tours of, well, six tours of Canada, four of Australia, three of New Zealand, about four in the States, all over mainland Europe. And I've got a sort of a, a little cult following everywhere. And, and people can just, you know, people can just, you know, can pick the stuff up. People can just go to my page and then they get to hear everything that I'm doing. Um, Isn't it a little not, weird, though? You, you get you connect with more people and yet the, the feeling of uh, it's, it's a bit of an isolated way to connect with people. It's not like being in a room with a bunch of people reacting. And that, I mean, the strangest thing is doing a concert where you don't have applause at the end of a song or poem, isn't it? It takes some getting used to. Eh? Well, I, it, I tell you, this is something you're absolutely right. It takes getting used to. But the funny thing is, when you do get used to it, I mean, for the first time, I, you know, it's funny because I said this spontaneously to, to Rubina, my wife. After we, because Glastonwick last Saturday, we had something like 22 performers, including, you know, people. We had Mick Thomas, who you've met, I think, once from from from, from Melbourne, Australia. Weddings, parties, anything. Fantastic we had, we had, songwriter. We had, we had David Egg Eggleton from New Zealand, the New Zealand poet laureate. We had all kinds of people from all over the place. Uh, so you could just make it more international because they don't all have to go to Glastonwick, what isn't it? That what wonderful. Was, yeah. The sort of people that wouldn't have been able to get to Glastonwick normally, they were all there. But what was wonderful about it was for the first time, I, having sat in my office on my computer with a load of beer for 12 hours, when I finished, I, mean, I, I to be fair, let me make this quite clear, <laughs> I wasn't doing the tech. A guy called Paul Stapleton was putting it all together behind the scenes, and well done, Paul, for that. I was doing, I was comparing and obviously programmed it all and did the publicity for it, but we had 2,500 people on the page, so at any time there was at least sort of 250, 300 people watching. Um and after 12 hours of this, and there were different people all the time. I mean, there was 2,000 people watching at some point during the day, at least. And at the end of all of this, when I finished, I, I, I said to Rabini, you know, I know I've been sitting in my office for 12 hours, but actually for the very first time in all these broadcasts that I've been doing for the last three months, I actually had the same feeling of, of, of being engaged and communicating with people and out there that I do normally. Because the feedback was so fantastic. There were so many people on there that I knew. that It was actually, yeah. I actually felt like I was there. It, it didn't, a lot of the, before, when I started off, it felt really weird. Um, now, it's just kind of a new way of doing things. And to be absolutely honest, David, because, because of my lung condition, I am going to be really, really wary about live performance for the foreseeable future until we're absolutely certain that this fucking thing is is gone or it is very 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 nearly gone and yeah. i'm not relying on the british government to tell me either so mm -hmm. i'm actually getting to the point now where i'm thinking well i've got my 40th anniversary anthology my heart on my sleeve it's called um, heart on my sleeve for 40 years of poems and songs going to be 350 pages books at least three book of 350 pages i've got a vinyl album coming out celebrating 40 years published by my mate Yuka in, in, in uh, Tampere in Finland. Um, and, and, and all the gigs I was supposed to do in this massive tour to celebrate 40 years of Attila the Stop Rocker, obviously they've all been cancelled. But I'm now getting to the point where I'm thinking, actually, you know, if I, if I, because I'm, I've got so much material, I can do so many different sorts of performances on my page, you know, broadcasting just to what I've got and on Twitter a bit as well. But the other thing I love doing is doing things like this. So I go into a different environment. It's like you go, it's like, you go to different gigs so you go to so i've got my gig which is you know which is my facebook page and then i've got other gigs which which i deliberately don't put on my page so other people are there right, and the right. people on my page aren't constantly bombarded with with stuff from me which makes it less of a kind of special event when yeah, i'm there yeah. and of course the other thing is because i because i'm a poet spoken word performer i play a lot of instruments i write songs i'm also a political commentator and i'm also into football and all the rest of it i'm doing so many different things it, it's actually i'm learning broadcasting skills i'm yeah. learning how to i've even learned set design to a degree i haven't bothered tonight particularly but for a couple of them if you look on my videos on my facebook on my, on my facebook page you'll see some of the different set designs that i've managed to get together for some of these books it's fascinating it's absolutely fascinating John, there's there's going to be, as you probably will recall, having toured uh, with me here in the U.S. anyway, there's going to be some people hearing a lot of what you're just saying and thinking, oh, yeah, OK, that that's all making sense. And then you said 
football and they're like what wait a sec what because it, there's a there's a general loathing of of organized sports on the left in the us as you know and you know in large sectors of the left but yeah, but Portland, in europe and it's very different it, yeah oh, that, it has followers definitely the there's, i mean basketball an, football. An anti, the portland timbers have an anti-fascist group mate i'm, I'm completely yeah no it, 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 this is for things are evolving here absolutely yeah, 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 but the, but yeah, the yeah, left-wing yeah. football scene uh or soccer scene in in england and germany is really a whole uh, different level of of activity all, all over say, mainland you know, europe left hand all over. Right, left hand sadly right wing as well in mainland europe but and yeah, fans I mean, supporters have to actually be kept physically apart which is something that that people don't may not realize if they go to, if they've been to games in the US where if supporters or fans of both teams can actually be in the same areas of the stadium as i understand it that this is uh, this is not the case in Europe that where where they're t kept in different sections of the stadium and i, I yeah, just yeah, i find true. that whole thing fascinating and you have a lot of involvement that, with this and you play a lot for left wing football teams all over Europe including like San Pauli and yeah, Hamburg yeah, which is probably yeah, the most well known yeah. Anti-fascist yeah, football team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you can you put put left-wing football into a little context for viewers well, who may not our, be familiar? I mean, yeah, it's part of our culture. For me, I've just grown up loving football, and the and part of what I love about it is the is the choreography, or if you like, on the terraces. It's the way that because for a lot of people, football is is there. You know, if you work, if you sort of working class, or working person of any class, um, you know, uh, you, you're doing your job five days a week, and it's the way you let off steam. And for me, it's a bit different because I'm a performance party musician. Um, but yeah, I mean, football is football is very much it's a very much a grassroots. I mean, I do a lot of my I've written, I'm in a poet in residence of Brighton of Albion. I've got I've got my poetry in the stadium on, and that's the local uh, football that's our local team, team yeah. in I mean, Brighton. And, you know, so 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 it's like you know, it's a football or soccer, as you would call it, is a part of our culture, and it's not like American football in the sense it's a lot more until sadly until recently it's getting more like it now but until recently it was a lot more kind of grassroots and less manufactured than american football a lot more connected to real sort of local culture i guess the college teams in the state so i i know very little about that but i mean you know i mean what i i, I will say david one thing i wanted to talk to you about tonight and there's this there's this massive great big thing going on and i wanted to talk to you about about the whole black lives uh, matter protests and the whole anti far ridiculous yeah i'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on this because i know another and i also want to put it into a little context because i mean i don't know how much you know all everybody out there might know about the history of the anti-racist yeah, like rock against racism and on so much of this kind of thing that was uh, gauged back to the 80s when there were in, Port, in the streets of portland and also in, in england yeah in 70s and lots of conflict between uh explicitly far right and explicitly far left anti-fascist uh anti-racist uh, elements of society and uh, yeah absolutely i mean the, the um i mean what 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 trump said about an anti-far i mean anti-far doesn't exist as a as a as a it's, a, it's a, just it's anti-fascist i mean it's not yeah it's, not, it's a concept it's not even an organization a and, a, and, a, and a board structure you know it's completely i mean but the guy you know why is what they're, they're, what i said what i said or one of my comments on on social media about this was um you know i understand fully well why donald trump doesn't like anti-far it's the same reason flies don't like fly spray i mean you know i mean <laughs> He, you know, the reason he doesn't like anti-fascists is because he's a fascist. He's a white supremacist. Right. I mean, you know, it's self-evident, isn't it? I mean, uh, God's sake. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I still, I scratch my head and think, okay, if our electoral system can allow um, an absolute egocentric n n loser with not a brain of cell in his body who's controlled by a puppet called Dominic Cummings to get elected with 43% of the vote, how much more bizarre is it when in America, you have a president who actually receives three million fewer votes than his opponent in election and 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 becomes president. That is just, I mean, OK, the worst opponent ever in probably the history of America. But I mean, you know, Donald Trump is Jefferson Davis. I mean, you know, I, I know about yeah. the American Civil War. I mean, Donald Trump, it's like the other way around, you know, like the, the incumbent is Jefferson Davis and the insurgent. I mean, God's sake. What hope have we got with Joe Biden? But at least he's not Donald Trump. I mean, if, if Bernie yeah, was yeah. if Bernie was standing now, Bernie would be really up there and really yeah, out yeah. there. I mean, yeah. you know, Biden's not he's not been absolutely abysmal, but he doesn't he doesn't really. I mean, it is ridiculous what is going on, and and the you know, I mean, the Black Lives. I mean, it's brilliant that the the 
the awful circumstances which created the Black Lives Matter movement coming forward in this way in such a powerful form is fantastic. Yeah. And obviously, as you know, the same thing's happened over here now, you know, yeah. but it just, mm -hmm. you know, and it just makes me, it, you know, and we've got, I mean, it, it's really, it's inspirational and really, really good. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, I mean, you know, there's, a, there's, I mean, I, there's no way that Trump's going to get reelected, but I mean, I can't see that possibly happening now. But I mean, the, um, the, the, the division in America now is, has got to be, you know, not far short of the same as it was in 18, 1861. I mean, you know, it's a, a we got to be fair on this. There's a majority. There was a majority then. A majority, for whatever reasons, were on the right side of history, and a minority was on the wrong side of history. It seems to me that the division is probably about similar now in terms of numbers. I mean, I mean, what's you know, what's going on now? One of the notable thing that's going on now is is that this is no matter how you cut it, this is a multiracial up. Uprising. This is an intersectional uprising. It's a, and that's that's a, yeah, Absolutely. that's a fascinating. And this time, I mean, this time, as opposed to you know, to 150 years ago, now um, this time it's the you know it's 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 the people of color who are taking the lead. I mean, you know, in in the in the first time round, you know, after after Harper's Ferry and everything, it was basically you know anti-slavery whites with some with some. Um, of people of color supporting them against racists and this time now the the movement is being led by by people of color which is brilliant and how it should be i mean you know it's 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 inspirational to look at i mean you know but the, the dysfunctional nature of both britain and america's british and american society right now in terms of the the fact that that these that, that repre representative democracy in however corrupt or perverted a form representative democracy has elected Donald Trump and 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 Boris Johnson and Bolsonaro in in um, in Brazil leads me and I'm I'm writing quite a lot about this at the moment to the conclusion that representative democracy itself is now unfit for purpose uh, and that we have to have some form, a different way of of basically electing um, the people who, who who run society, and and I'm not saying for a moment saying that that universal suffrage is unfit for purpose, um, because everybody should have a vote, but that vote has got to be based on knowledge, and an understanding and respect for the decisions that are being taken, not on vote farming by unelected billionaires um, with huge media resources being yeah newspapers. the media i mean when the unelected billionaires also run the media and have yeah. done for generations then this uh, creates a very toxic situation Absolutely. i mean yeah. and obviously capitalism it has has uh, miserably failed in terms of i mean this is ex it's exposed it's being ex so so exposed by this pandemic and also the the cla the nature of class and race divisions in society and how you know some people are dying so much more than others because they're essential workers or the historic inequalities and all this uh, it's really com coming to light but also this is um as as much as the situation here is completely disastrous it in britain uh the the death rate uh for for people is, is so totally unequal and, and there must be a, a lot of this uh uprising that's now spread from minneapolis to many other countries uh it must have a lot of local flavor to it over there uh, well, absolutely i mean what the the, the 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 specific nature of it here is there's twofold one is that the <coughs> i mean for a start we don't believe a single statistic that's coming out of the government in terms of the death rate or the infection rate i mean we, we believe it when it's coming from 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 sources linked to the nhs and that's what i'm going on and it seems now that the majority of deaths have actually been in care homes uh, and this could have been completely avoided if lockdown had happened earlier and of those that which have not happened in care homes, um, there is a majority, or not a majority, but a disproportionate number of black Asian, black minority ethnic people who are suffering. Um, you know, and this, some of the m m sort of um, biological studies suggest that there may be a genetic um, sort of pre, you know, a, a, a sort of m m a fact that makes people of colour more genetically susceptible but to be blunt the most obvious self-evident screaming in your face reason is because they're the ones you know who have the worst um social conditions and when it comes to working in hospitals it is now being proved and this is coming out as well 
that there is a kind of an endemic racism in the NHS in the sense that it tends to be people of colour who are automatically shoved into the most dangerous situations when it comes to be to dealing with this virus. And the other thing, David, is even more contemptible, of course, is that in this country, um, they didn't, I mean, despite the fact that they knew that something like they they re rehearsed for something like this, they didn't get the the uh, the um, PPE, the protective equipment in place. And then when it all started happening, um, all these firms in the UK started offering to make the stuff um, and they turned them down. And then and mm -hmm. handed out handed out contra contacts to their to their private big private corporate friends who then completely messed up getting this stuff because of course everyone else in the world was trying to get it at the same time. I mean, so you know everything about this is just completely corrupt. Yeah, I mean, it's completely. a sea. There's a well, sea of corruption. Mm -hmm. Another and, thing, if you've seen Ken Loach's uh, uh, latest uh, movie, uh, uh, you know what was it six months ago or whatever? Uh, sorry, I missed you. Uh, uh, one, what, one of the two uh, main characters that he's following around is a woman who, who works in, in care homes and, yeah. uh, and for uh, elderly folks at their uh, residences. And yeah. she's going around to 10, 12 residences per day, driving, yeah. going around on a public bus because she can't yeah. afford a car. And, <clears throat> and, and this is very common for care home workers in England as it is here. So, I mean, what also they're finding is that uh, th it's the workers themselves who have been spreading the uh, virus and getting the virus because they're moving around from one place to another. So even, so the only care homes that have been locked down that it, where, where the virus has been kept out have been the examples that I've heard of like in Connecticut and in Germany and other places where they've not locked down care homes where the workers have locked down with the residents. Well, uh, but I, I, but if, if the workers are paid sub minimum wages and are moving from one care home to the next, then here's another failing of neoliberalism of austerity. Well, capitalism. I, mean, they did, I, I have personal experience of this because my mother-in-law is in a care home and they locked down two weeks before the official lockdown started and they have no agency workers. No, ah, not, they didn't have so the people. workers locked down yeah. with them. No, no, they didn't. They didn't sleep in there. But the workers were very, very careful because it's, mm. it's not a commercial. It's not a run by a bunch of granny farmers trying to make money. It's run by a Christian charity. So, you know, whatever you think about the church in this particular area, they do really good work. So basically, you've got a load of care workers that are committed to the, to the people they're looking after. And they're really careful about what they about how they conduct themselves so they don't get the virus. None of, fortunately, none of them have got the virus. And there were none of the agency staff coming in, because a lot of the time in these care homes, you've got agency staff coming, because they pay such low wages. There's a huge turnover. So they've got agency staff coming in to cover. Yeah. And those agency staff are mainly working in the care homes that are run by the, by the local council, local authority, because the agency staff obviously are employed by agencies who charge a huge amount of money for each agency worker to go in there and then pay that worker maybe one third of what they get for the services of the worker um so that's what another reason why it's it spreads so 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 fast i mean the care home where my mother-in-law is locked down two weeks before everywhere else and has stayed um you know stayed locked down with the same staff um <clears throat> who have been incredibly careful and obviously you know they've been lucky as well because um you know in this part of the country we've had relatively few incidences of it compared to elsewhere um but yeah i mean the, the the failings of private enterprise of capitalism of of the market economy to deal with all of this have, have just been there all the way through i mean you know the, bluntly you know as i've said and i've said this more than once bluntly it's at times like this that basically prove that in terms of keeping people alive educated housed and fed state socialism works best now and, and talk more about that because i mean you you've done quite a you did quite a bit of touring in the gdr before uh, the wall came down and you also had one of the most fascinating and entertaining first visits to albania that i've ever read about i mean your book arguments yard is a fantastic read if anybody's looking for a good memoir to read but um i think my favorite 
uh, little uh, anecdotes are when you were 13 years old and you went into a left wing bookstore for the first time and learned about Albanian tractor production yeah. and uh, your first visit to Albania with an English football team. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, which which apparently you were you were responsible for the first ever punk rock concert to take place in Albania as well. Correct, and I, you know, and I'd, I'd be I think people Steve would be very interested. Yes, yeah, Steve. Yeah. Steve with the Newtown Neurotics. I think people would love to hear about your visit to Albania and your your touring in, in the GDR. Any any reflections you have on any of that? Well, yeah. I mean, the the in in terms of I mean, in terms of um, my time in the GDR, and I spent a lot of time there, enough time to basically learn German there. Um, in terms of the social security, you know, in terms of people, you know, everybody had a reliable income. Nobody had to worry about the the basically. The, the most important things of life, which are having enough to eat, having a roof over your head, making sure that your family is, 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 is clothed and fed and housed and warm. All those things were provided as of right by the state. And, what are the, and, and people always say, rightly, yes, but there, you, but there was no freedom of speech. Well, there was freedom of speech, but not, um, you know, not, in, not in, in the way that we in the West perceive it. It was different. Um, but ultimately, the way I would, ex the way I express this, this conundrum is like this yes when we talk about democracy we're in the west we're always talking about the right to say what you want without getting looked up by the police or without getting you know beaten up or without getting the state coming down on your ton of bricks um but the going along with that is this idea that you you can have a that somehow a state which is democratic i.e where you have that freedom and yet where people are sleeping on the streets and starving is somehow better more worthy than a state where nobody is starving no one is sleeping on the streets everybody is has enough to eat everybody has a job but there is more c controlling of political or social mores and and opinions or whatever now what i would say about that is actually you know for if you're a human being you start worrying about what comes out of your mouth at the moment when you've got enough going into it um you know and and the fact of the matter was that in the gdr um, you know, I was in a country where basically all the really essential things of life were covered. And the real battle was then to liberalise, if you want to call it that, the, the, the politics and to make it to keep the socialist system and make it more democratic and more open, which is what we did as the very first punk rockers ever to be invited to the GDR is what we were trying to do. So and it's much easier to have a really well functioning economic um, so economically, um, <coughs> if you like, functioning system where which is egalitarian, where everybody is okay, and then liberalise the politics a bit, then it is to do it the other way around. In other words, where you can shout off and mouth off like whatever you want, and, I'll, and you know, 20% of the population living in abject poverty. I mean, it's a lot easier to have an economic base and then liberalise the political and cultural superstructure, you know, than it is to do it the other way around. And yeah, that is and why also I... not to minimize the uh, the the you know the terrible problems that people have had with uh, secret police in many different countries, including in in the GDR and wherever no, else. But well, I'm not but the that. no, but the, but but what I've what I what I gleaned from your your book and from reading also from stuff that Rob Johnson has written about his experiences there and other other people who have just spent a lot of time in the GDR. Was that so? So much of it was. It, it wasn't necessarily about uh, whether people could express a wide variety of different opinions, but the question was whether you're going to get state support to publish a book or a play or put out a movie or something like that, which is kind of like the same kind of problems that people deal with in, in the capitalist countries. It's just they're not looking for state support so much as some other kind of support or they don't get any support at all. <laughs> but, uh, but but like, uh, I mean, that, that I don't know. It's it just it just there was, there was, it seems like center on every bloody corner in East Germany. I mean, you know, we, we, we were doing gigs in factories at lunchtime for the workers. And I mean, this wasn't something that was just put on as a bit of a show. This is something that happened anyway. Um, it's a complete, I mean, you know, it's, it's very, I always say with, with all of that, with state socialism, actually existing socialism, about 70% of what I saw was really good and 30% was really bad. And there wasn't much that was in the middle between the two because the pollution was terrible. Um, mm -hmm. And some of the stupid restrictions, um, you know, it, it culturally were absolutely unforgivable. But at the same time, I was, I would never complain about somebody getting, get it in the, in the deck for being a fascist or wanting to re-establish capitalism. But I would get 
could complain with someone getting it in the neck for wanting there to be less pollution or the right to play the kind of music that they wanted, you know, regardless of what form it was, uh, you know, i.e., you know, the, the, the old cliche about you're a punk rocker, um, you got a Mohican, you get you, you get taken in by the by the fopos, you get your head shaved, and then you get picked up by the Stasi and accused of being a Nazi skinhead. I mean, that was a sort of a joke, but but it was absolutely true to some degree. I mean, you know, it, but, there, but there is a lot we can learn from from the, from that kind of of environment because ultimately, you know, what we have learned in the last few weeks. I mean, you know, the, the Tories in this country, the Conservative Party, the right wing, have had to institute the most radical left-wing socialist collective um, sort of s subsidy system for the country just to stop everything completely, literally collapsing. I mean, I have earned my living as a self-employed poet musician since 1980. I have paid tax since 1982, and I am currently in receipt of a grant from the government to be a left-wing punk rock poet and musician. Um, and, and I bloody deserve it because I paid into the system for 38 years and now all my gigs have been cancelled. So I'm so I'm doing that. But I mean, one of the other things I wanted to say, because I know we're probably stuck, we're stopping, are we stopping at seven o'clock? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, but I did want to say this ab about that. I know we're ranging over a variety of topics and I know that I'm always talking a lot. Which well, that, that's how I like it. But a wide variety of subjects. But what, I, what, I, what, I, what I did want to say about this is, but one, obviously, I'm sure in America you have the same thing. I know to some degree it's not functioning very well, but people are getting, you know, they're getting money, if you like. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not yeah. working well, but the bailout has been like something that you would never imagine yeah, a capitalist right. country doing. So I it's know. been fascinating. No, it's been no, happening all over the place. Yeah. Have, you, have you been, have you got, did you get a grant? Have, have I No, I just got, uh, so far all I've gotten is the same, uh, the, the same basically federal check that everybody who makes less than uh, $80,000 a year has gotten. And, but the unemployment, which I now qualify for as a musician, uh, the, the unemployment system in every state seems to be basically paralyzed and they're, they're using um, computer code from the 1960s and having to like get people out of their, out of retirement who still know how yeah. to use these yeah. languages. Yeah. 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 But uh, so there's like tens of thousands of people just in Oregon alone who include me who are still waiting uh, for any kind of a check but what weird what happens in this country is we have there's i mean for, for musicians as everybody else if you're self-employed and you're on the system and you've been paying tax for three years you get a grant and it works it, it's very easy to claim i got it you know and, it, and it, it's kept me going i mean I, we're okay anyway so i'm doing it for four years i'm 62 the family's grown up we're basically all right anyway but loads of people have fallen through the cracks especially much younger people who haven't been paying tax for three years the people obviously who've been just Doing it on the in the black market economy, doing gigs in pubs or or busking on the streets. So what we've set up, my friend Gail Something Else, who runs the Something Else series of festivals, has set up a thing called Field B, um, which is an organisation raising money to help DIY musicians whose income has, of course, completely disappeared. And of course, in the states, as here, well, here as in the states, um, the festival season, which is starting basically just before now finishing in, in mid-September is the time where most people earn most of their income. And, and that is gone. <laughs> that's not happening. Glast yeah, exactly. Well, obviously that's not happening. And Glastonwick, the festival that I've been running for 25 years, which was online last weekend, raised four, over four and a half thousand pounds, um, of which after we've covered the costs of actually having to cancel our festival, you know, paying, paying all the bits we had to pay for, for, for the hire of stuff that we couldn't then use and for the, for the, for the um, publicity. Mm. basically we're going to have well over three grand to to use to help musicians who are, who are in that situation and there are more and more people now you know i mean it's not just diy musicians i mean all musicians i mean there was a, i read an article today about classical musicians i mean the, the the you know the country's great orchestras are in peril because they're not gigging it they're not doing any gigs or whatever no. concerts and of course these are people who you know they're they're fur furloughed now but i mean you know we're going to be us entertainers are going to be the last people to go back to work in this. Exactly. Because we, we rely on having, you know, I mean, a lot of us, I mean, I'm playing most of the time. I'm, my average audience is between 50 and 100 people. I'm playing in a small room. It's not yeah. packed yeah. with people. We're not, I mean, right. you know. And uh, it has uh, to be because, as you know, the, I mean, the venues yeah. are shrinking. There are fewer yeah. venues. They're more, more expensive, expensive uh, oftentimes to use. It's harder to find 
good gigs in England with with venues that are big enough to hold 50 or 100 people. And so you, you inevitably have to have people packed in. So, I mean, the, the question for the restaurants being able to function and bars and cafes with 25% of their normal uh, number of people. But I mean, for performers like us, I, it's hard to imagine how this is ever going to be. Well, things can't I'll, possibly I'll get back to normal. I'll explain to you what's happening here. I want, I'll explain to you what's happening here, David. For a start, regardless of what the government is doing, and none of us trust them as far as we can throw them anyway, but there's a huge amount of, of self, self-help going on now. Um, let's, let, just in two days, three days' time, I'm doing a gig for Save the Mine, my, uh, Moster Miners Club in Manchester, which is, well, you, as it sounds like, a former miners club, which is now a community venue where I've performed many times, uh, linked to the Radical Football Club, FC United of Manchester, incidentally. Talking about what we were saying before, um, and, and they are they, they have benefits. Which the money goes to to keep the club going, to to pay the rent and the other things that they have got to pay at a time when obviously they're not getting any income. Um, same thing happening all over the place. There's literally hundreds of fundraisers going on through an organisation called the Small Venues Trust to keep mm. the Music Venues Trust to keep these venues alive. And there's a huge amount of people who are prepared to do that. I mean, you know, but, but you know, we are doing this ourselves. I mean, in the same way that, that I'm raising money to help musicians who haven't got any income, unlike me, because I I get the grant from the government. Um, there are many, many people, you know, doing gigs and, and organising events to help venues that have obviously still got to pay rent and all the other stuff um, and aren't getting anyone coming in, you know, buying beer and, and paying entrance fees and all the things that keep them going. Um I mean, you know, the, 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 the one positive thing to come out of all this, I would say, is, I mean, OK, the government, both in the States and Britain, two of the most right wing capitalist countries in the world, have had to institute sort of levels of, of socialist support for all kinds of areas of the economy that would have been unthinkable in any other situation. Being that as it may. There's still a lot of people who have fallen through the cracks. A lot. And, and a lot we, of businesses business closing too. Yeah. I mean, and that's we, happening yeah, here. Yeah. And we are doing and we are doing everything that we can in the field of music and culture to help the people that are at the front end of this and, and support them. And that is one of the good things that's coming out of this. Yeah, the, all the mutual aid is fantastic. But yeah. when you consider how much pe- these businesses like a pub or a cafe, how much they are often spending in rent if they're if they're you know that's i mean the rents on the high streets in england and here and, and I mean, down, I, it's just i've seen everything you've been doing about the rents in in portland i mean you know the the, le- the rent levels in portland and the whole uh, situation there i mean you're going to have when, when when all this finishes whenever it does there's going to be an absolute crisis in terms of the rent sector in portland isn't there? yeah you know, absolutely you know, it's I mean, the most rent, rent burden city in the country rent strike now you know um, is, and are there rent strikes going on over there? Any of that well, kind of thing? Not at the moment, because everybody's. I mean, you know, at the moment the rents are being paid, but when because the government stopped, has stepped in, yeah, yeah. yeah. When that stop, have they stopped? Have they stepped in in t- completely in Portland as well? No, no. no they, right. There's a suspension on evictions, uh, but uh, if you if you're not getting if you're not working or getting unemployment money from the government, then you have to. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. theoretically, be paying your rent, but because of the suspension on evictions, you you actually don't have to be paying your rent. But eventually, you will. Yeah. You know, unless they're yeah, going to eventually exactly cancel. the same here. Exactly the same here, and it's all going to come to a crunch in a few weeks or months' time, probably two or three months' time. Right, uh, and, and then we are going to see huge seismic changes. I think. I mean, yeah, you know, that's... because because I, I I don't believe that the that the that the liberal that the neoliberal are going to be able to get away with 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 it anymore because what's your prediction what's your prediction for the next few months it's very difficult to say but my prediction is that the that they will my prediction is that on balance i'm 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 still not sure about this but i think on balance they will be forced into a kind of almost a state socialist um in in the uk to, to some degree some form of state socialist subsidy system for the foreseeable future because the alternative will literally be mass social unrest, and that the and that the uh, the forces of you know the forces that they will depend on to quell ma- mass socialist social unrest will not be prepared to do it because they are from the same backgrounds as the people who will be suffering, and they know that. I mean, there's no way of telling it. In a, right. You know, there's no way, but you know, I don't think that the army or the police would be prepared to you know brutalize or mow down hundreds of thousands of starving homeless people which is what will happen if 
the government does not basically institute a massive program of subsidy for huge areas of the economy and the housing market, right? The, yep. I mean, if they don't, there is going to be there is going to be mass unemployment, mass homelessness, and therefore there will be there will be mass unrest. And I don't, and I'm not saying for a moment that these people in power have any have any um, compassion or fellow feeling or anything like that. But I think purely out of self preservation, yeah, yeah. they will go. Hang on a minute. If we do this, we are relying on our armed forces and our police to protect us from people who are their brothers, sisters, friends. You know, because most people who are in the police and the army aren't, aren't that didn't go to Eton and have millionaire backgrounds. You know. Yeah. Um, and do you think I, the politicians who did go to Eton <laughs> are, uh, are are smart enough to to uh, make that connection? Because I'm not at all sure that Trump or Kushner are sm smart enough to make that well, connection. Well, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure about that either. I'm I'm just but the ironic thing about Dominic Cummings, who basically controls Johnson, is that he is smart enough to realize that to realize that Dominic Cum Cummings is a kind of a um, kind of a Strasserite figure. Uh, is kind of national socialism i mean he he's 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 upper class he's come from that sort of background himself but he's got the he's got the nous to realize that you can't actually throw people on the street and starve them you can poison them with right-wing ideology but they're going to forget about that if they haven't got a roof over their head and their kids are starving so i think and my prediction is that in the short term the government will institute these measures what happens after that? I don't know. I mean, you know, if how much difference, just turning it around, because we've only got four minutes. Big question for you is, and I think I know what your answer is going to be. How much difference do you think it will make if and when Biden wins the, the US election? I mean, because obviously, you know, Biden, I, I know about him from, from, from a long way back. And Biden is Biden, but he's not a white supremacist, um, egomaniac, lunatic. So how much change do you think will happen if Biden wins the election? I mean, <clears throat> I would normally say uh, that there's there's the, the difference between the two parties is insignificant in a situation like this, but uh, right now uh, I think it's it's a different um, it's a different situation because because Biden is while he's basically a, a corrupt politician uh, from a small state that's completely controlled by banks uh, called Delaware. Uh, you know, he he um, he he he's a team player. He knows how to work with other uh, politicians. He's not a, a, a you know a, a fascist megalomaniac, which, which is I mean that if that's the bar, you know at yeah. least you yeah. know yeah he's <laughs> so okay. I, I, yeah, I thought you were going to say that. I, I'm I'm glad you said that because I thought that's what you would say. That however awful he is, Trump he's is not Trump. Trump is Trump is unique in American history. I mean. You know, he's even worse. He's actually worse than Jefferson Davis because Jefferson Davis was at least a, fig a representative, a controllable figurehead of a bunch of, of racist, uh, evil racist thugs. But at least the evil racist thugs had control over him. Trump appears to have is just completely quixotic and yeah. completely in has no nobody in control of him at all. And the ludicrous thing is that the American Constitution and the people who uphold it appear to, to be prepared to let that happen. I mean, it's like, well, you know, he's, I mean, they, they've made a pact with the devil, It's it, which is, I think, very much along. I mean, for anyone like like you who's very familiar with uh, the history of Germany in the 1930s, I think there's a lot of parallels here in mm -hmm. terms of making pacts with the devil because the devil provides loads of arms contracts. Yeah. I mean, I've noticed significantly that however bad, however unpopular Trump now is, thank God, with the <clears throat> excuse me, with the more <clears throat> majority of Americans, excuse me, uh, I shouldn't eat chocolate. I talk at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't help with your throat. Ch it's like the opposite of like uh, uh, mint tea. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, um, the, the, um, however, I'm popular with the majority of Americans. I noticed that the stock exchange, the stock market is still reacting negatively to the concept of Trump being defeated because Trump's policies, however completely disgusting and, and, and insane in terms of any form of rational social program, um, are favoured by top capitalists because the uh, the um, Wall Street 
index goes up because he reduces yeah. the tax and everything. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah. Although Wall Street was plummeting when Wall Street thought that there was going to be like a total chaos or a revolution. But now that they think things are under control, they prefer Trump. <laughs> so, so what yeah. you want is, is uh, yeah, it's it's a, this, the walking this bizarre uh, line. Yeah. Well, John Bain, Attila the Stockbroker, thank you so much for joining you, me for the hour. To see you again, mate. It's absolutely lovely to see you. Yeah, um, great I will to see you. Touch with you about being involved in a couple more of the things that we're planning in in the near future. Oh yeah, more um, online events. All, all those out across the pond. Uh, if you're more interested in what I'm doing and what I've been saying, I'm on I'm on Facebook on my, my former page, uh, Attila the Stockbroker. Um, just put Attila the Stockbroker into anything, you'll find it. And um, yeah, lovely to see you, mate. Yeah, great to see you. Take care, John. All, all the best, mate. Cheers. 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 Bye. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in to this discussion with John Bain, a.k.a. Attila the Stockbroker. Tomorrow I'll be talking with Evergreen State College history professor Larry Mosqueda. You can find all of these discussions archived on my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash drovix in the Discussions with David playlist. You'll also find them all in podcast form if you search for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting platform or via the David Rovix mobile app or on my website at davidrovix.com. I have a new album out on Bandcamp, which you can stream for free, called Notes from a Failed State. The music, the live stream broadcasts, and the podcasts are all free. But if you want to support my journalistic and musical efforts, plus have access to some exclusive offerings just for patrons, please join my Community Supported Art Program, or CSA, at davidrovix.com slash subscribe, or patreon.com slash davidrovix. Hope to see you again soon here in the Matrix and out on the streets. Don't pay the rent and don't be afraid of your neighbors. Mutual aid will get us through. Bye for now.